The Tom Woods Show, episode 1638. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're considering homeschooling, you know I recommend the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum for which I created 400 videos. It's an excellent education in all the standard subjects, plus personal finance for teens, how to be an effective public speaker, how to run a home business, the kinds of things nobody teaches, but they darn well should. Not to mention it's self-taught, so you get your sanity back as a parent. Make sure you join at my special link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses you can't get anywhere else. Check it out at ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Virus-free episode for you today. And in fact, for those of you who keep close track of this, this is only the fourth episode of the week rather than the usual five. And the reason for that is the subject matter of today's episode involves a law review article about homeschooling that came to my attention because it was widely discussed in the media. And then I had people writing to me, although I have, of course, already seen it. And they want to know if I would do anything with it, maybe write an issue in my newsletter about it, or maybe devote an episode of the podcast to it. So I decided I would do that. And yesterday, I set my alarm to wake up a little early. I thought, I'll wake up early, I'll read the article, and then I'll comment on it for the podcast. I woke up, I had not realized that the article is 80 pages long. And I thought, well, if I try to rush this, I'm going to do a lousy job and I'm not going to do it justice. And that's going to be unfortunate. So I don't want to do that. So instead, I waited. I spent the day taking the time I needed with it. And then it turned out that a big portion of it is really not that relevant. But let me first explain what this is. This is an article in the Arizona Law Review by a a Harvard Law professor named Elizabeth Bartholet. And it's called Homeschooling. Parent Rights Absolutism versus Child Rights to Education and Protection. And the reason this article is getting a lot of attention is not that most people scan the Arizona Law Review on a regular basis, and that's not how it got out to the media. What happened was Harvard Magazine interviewed her about her article, and then that leaked out because it got picked up by a lot of, let's say, right-wing outlets, but not like, you know, crazy right-wing outlets, but just very mainstream ones like the Daily Caller started reporting on it, and that's why it got a lot of attention. Now, it's true, the Arizona Law Review is not the most important thing in the world, but to me, this is a valuable article in that the candor is refreshing. We learn as if we didn't know it already, at least we get confirmation of, what the blue check marks really think about you, what academia really thinks about you. And they think, You're a stupid, backward hick whose children need to be taken away for most of the day and told what to think. And you think, Woods, surely this is some right-wing exaggeration. I've I've heard these sorts of things about you, Woods, and now I'm hearing it from right from your mouth. Well, I'm going to read passages from this article to you, and you see if there's any other way to interpret them. I think it's revealing, and, and it's important for us to know exactly what we're up against. Her thesis is generally as follows that we hear a lot of positive things about homeschooling because we see that the spelling bee champion happened to be homeschooled and this and that student who got perfect score in the SAT happened to be homeschooled. But she says that these are anecdotal results and that a lot of the research that claims to show homeschooling yields beneficial results is not really very robust and it has a bias running through it in favor of homeschooling. So we hear about these outlying cases, which is how she thinks of them, but we don't hear about the ordinary work-a-day approaches to homeschooling in most homeschooling households. So what she thinks happens then is that the students, uh, not only do they get a poor education, but they're also not exposed to perspectives other than the ones their parents are feeding to them. And this will make it more difficult for them to function in a democracy because they won't be exposed to a variety of views. They won't know what it's like to encounter people with different views and to be able to engage with them. They won't have some of the extracurricular experiences that students in school will have. And this will have negative effects on society. So there are problems that the students are potentially at risk of experiencing as well as 
problems that society faces as a result of homeschooling. So this is perhaps a good summary. She, this is from her paper. This homeschooling regime, meaning the, sets of, the set of laws and regulations surrounding homeschooling that exist in the United States and almost exclusively in the United States, poses real dangers to children and to society. Children are at serious risk of losing out on opportunities to learn things that are essential for employment and for exercising meaningful choices in their future lives. They're also at serious risk for ongoing abuse and neglect in the isolated families that constitute a significant part of the homeschooling world. And then she says, society loses out as well. Homeschooling presents both academic concerns and democratic concerns. Appropriate education helps give children the academic skills needed to participate productively in society as adults through employment. It also makes children aware of important cultural values and provides skills enabling children to participate productively in their communities and the larger society. Oh, good grief, do I hate the phrase of the larger society. Every pompous jerk in college used that expression, the larger society. Don't ever talk like that. Okay, if you use that expression, just just get it out. That's awful. It sounds awful. It's terrible writing. It's pompous, just awfulness. The larger society, just get rid of that. Get rid of, set fire to that. Anyway, through various forms of civic engagement, even homeschooling parents capable of satisfying the academic function of education are not likely to be capable of satisfying the democratic function. So again, this democratic function she elaborates on she says, many homeschool children miss out on exposure to others with different experiences and values. Most all miss out on extracurricular activities like student government. She repeats this student government thing at least one other time in the paper. She's obsessed with student government as being an experience kids can't miss out on. You remember student government? Remember that when you were in school? It was a joke, right? It was nothing. Student government amounted to nothing. Nothing came of it. And nobody ran for office in student government on a platform. It was vote for Joe because he's a great football player. I mean, that was pretty much it. It was a popularity contest. So I suppose that is educational <laughs> to a degree. It teaches them how the world is. But good grief, nothing happens in student government. Of all possible things to be worried about, students missing out on. And then she says, a very large proportion of homeschooling parents are ideologically committed to isolating their children from the majority culture and indoctrinating them in views and values that are in serious conflict with that culture. Well, there it is, that paragraph right there. That is what they think of you. Now, let's go through that. Many homeschooled children miss out on exposure to others with different experiences and values. If you went to a school where you were really exposed to a buffet of experiences and values, I'd like to hear about it. Because I wasn't, and I know for a fact that my experience was not unusual. I was exposed to one set of values, and that's it. Elizabeth Bartholet, you think she was exposed to a wide array of experiences and values when she was in school? Really? I wonder if I were to talk to her about libertarianism, what I would learn from her about what she thinks about it. Well, chances are she knows about it only in caricature. She learned about libertarianism in the faculty lounge basically, from other people who learned about it in other faculty lounges. None of them have actually read anything in it. And it goes to show what Jonathan Haidt of NYU said, that now in his research, he was talking only about so-called liberals and conservatives. And we know that's a very stilted way of looking at the American political spectrum and ideological spectrum, but it's not nothing. It's something to work with. And he said that conservatives are much, much better at being able to describe what liberals believe and why they believe it than vice versa. And we all know that's true. I mean, come on. I can tell you exactly what a progressive believes. In fact, I think I could probably argue for it pretty effectively. Whereas I ask them, what does a libertarian or a conservative believe? They haven't got the slightest idea. I mean, they sort of get some of it, but why do I believe what I believe? Well, probably because I'm just a shill for industry who thinks that it's better for society if the strong dominate the weak. And then they'll probably say something about trickle-down economics, and that'll be it. They, they haven't got the slightest idea. And that's after years and years and years of supposedly being exposed to many different experiences and values. Nope. That is the one thing that we know for a fact does not happen. 
in school. And yes, you better believe I want to isolate my children from majority culture. Now, that doesn't mean they have no engagement with the culture around them. How would that be possible? I mean, unless I chained them to the desk, of course they're going to interact with so-called majority culture. But yeah, there's a lot of craziness in the world that I'd rather have them ignore as they grow up. I want them to be kids. I have this crazy idea that my kids should be kids and they shouldn't be involved in gender wars and all this other nonsense, which, by the way, is not being presented to children and families as another perspective they should bear in mind, but as an ideological imperative that is going to be forced on you by bullies. That is the way that that whole thing is approached. It is done by intimidation, by the implication that there's only one acceptable perspective on this. The idea that my kids are going to be exposed to a wide array of values on something like that in school is preposterous. They're going to be exposed to one set of beliefs, and it's a set of beliefs that they darn well better not speak out against, or they're going to be shunned and condemned. So that's what I want to keep them from. Yes, I do want to keep them from that, because it's evil to expose kids to that. Not to mention, what's so great about this majority culture anyway, this culture of Whatever the establishment tells you, you can't accept fast enough. So it's the Iraq war, you're on board for that. It's um, whatever they say about the virus and whatever unproven methods they have for coping with it, you jump on board, you repeat their propaganda, every single talking point, you've got it rehearsed. Uh, whatever it is, climate change, there's only one way to think about that and how we might cope with that. There's one way. Honestly, I can't think of a time when I seriously was given a number of ways to think about something in school. I cannot recall that. And again, I'm sure I'm not alone on this. And I do recall my high school history teacher as supposedly being a conservative. And I remember thinking, well, that'll be interesting when I take his class. I wonder how different that'll be. Not different at all. Not different at all. His perspective on history was the same as anybody else's. You would have no idea he was a so-called conservative. And in fact, I wondered, why is he conservative? I mean, he, according to him, the government's responsible for all the advances we've had in our standard of living and all that. He just teaches out of the textbook. It's, but he was a conservative, so that meant we were being exposed to a wide variety. Of, no, we weren't. He taught just like anybody else. And I left school slightly right of center. And that was only because of my parents indoctrinating me in their dangerous views. But wondering how anybody could be for laissez-faire. Don't you see that with laissez-faire to this day, your kids would be working in a coal mine for eight cents a day? I mean, how could anybody believe that? This was Mr. Grady at North Andover High School. Mr. Grady, who, I don't know, there are a lot of things I could say about him. I'm not gonna let my petty resentments get the better of me today. But I will say Mr. Grady was also the girls' basketball coach. Now, I'm not saying that people who are coaches can't also be excellent teachers. But I am saying that when you have a coach and when you have a teaching opening, they think, well, how much damage could he do as a history teacher? We got that. I got World Civ taught by uh, the boys basketball coach. And he was fine, but you knew for a fact he was one chapter ahead of you in the textbook. I think that was obvious to everybody. So the idea that will come up later in the paper that parents aren't qualified to teach, well, I'm sure these people I had they had a teaching certificate of some kind. I'm sure they had some education degree or something, but they weren't a world-renowned historians by any means. Let's put it that way. And plus, homeschooling has come a long way. This isn't 1978, for heaven's sake. Of course, parents aren't going to teach organic chemistry or calculus. You have somebody else teach that. They can teach it right over the computer. You can get some of the best teachers in the world to teach those subjects. And then you have Q&A forums when the students have problems like we have at the Ron Paul curriculum. And that's that, the problem solved. And incidentally, my, my math teacher in 11th grade was also uh, one of the athletic coaches. And I'll just, I don't know why I'm reminiscing like this, but I loved Mr. Kelly. He was, he was a great guy. He, he was pretty bright when it came to, to math, but this was a guy who at three o'clock he was on the golf course. I mean, that was, <laughs> he was checked out by then. But I just remember being in class, it was AP, whatever it was, and I was sitting in the front because where else would Nerdy Woods be sitting? And I remember him, he would get to about three quarters of the way through a problem and he would turn to me and say, uh, hey, Tommy, can you give me a little push here? 
<laughs> so I would help him through the rest of the problem. And then sometimes he would get partway through a problem and he would turn to us and say, and then from there you just put a bump, bump it and you're all done. He just didn't want to go through all the steps because he felt like by that point, if you don't know the steps, the, the, the grunge work of the problem, then forget it. And I did kind of respect that. Like, let's not, I mean, at this point, you should know that part. We already got through the challenging part. Anyway, that's my high school experience. Then we get to this. She says, the legal claim made in defense of the current homeschooling regime, so the, the set of laws and regulations surrounding homeschooling, is based on a dangerous idea about parent rights. Namely, she's going to say, that parents basically have absolute rights over their children. And that, this is now this is a direct quote, that parents who are committed to beliefs and values counter to those of the larger society... <laughs> are entitled to bring their children up in isolation so as to help ensure that they will replicate the parents' views and lifestyle choices. This legal claim is inconsistent with the child's right to what has been called an open future, the right to exposure to alternative views and experiences essential for children to grow up, to exercise meaningful choices about their own future views, religions, lifestyles, and work. Okay, so again, ex the right to exposure to alternative views and experiences. That is not what you get in school. We've, we've gone over that. And it's quite clear that what's being said here is we are going to take your kids so that we can teach them things that you hold, that you consider to be a parent. I mean, at least they're being refreshing in, in how open they are about it. She quotes somebody named Rob Reich as saying, at a bare minimum, one function of any school environment must be to expose children to and engage students with values and beliefs other than those of their parents. Okay. So you send your kids to these people and they are going to send your kids back with ideas that basically say your parents are stupid backward rubes because they don't believe in the superstition of the state. That's what's going to happen to them. That's what they're telling you right here. You have no right to be surprised. That's what they're telling you. It is just impossible for me not to be absolutely contemptuous of these people in academia. I can't stand the sight of them anymore. I used to say, well, they are smart, but they're just using their smarts for bad purposes. But I don't know what use this kind of smarts is. Like this is somebody who she's going to later spin some theory about how it is that children can be said to have positive constitutional rights to certain forms of education. Now, there's nothing to that, nothing whatsoever. She'll use the 14th Amendment to justify that. There's not anybody who had anything to do with the drafting and ratification of the 14th Amendment, who thought that it meant that these people would have the right to take your kids away so they can teach them things that you hate. There is no way anybody thought that. So therefore, that interpretation is invalid. And yeah, you would have to be smart to come up with something like that because it's so ridiculous you'd have to be really good at coming up with convoluted approaches to things. So I guess you need some smarts for that. But what good are these smarts? Yeah, again, I'm sure she took a lot of advanced classes and you know, knows some things. But what good is this? When the result is demonstrably false crap, when the result is articles like the one we're reading right now, these people, everything that comes out of their mouths is wrong. Everything. Whatever it is, whatever it's, it's here's how we're going to solve poverty. And then poverty gets worse. And not only does it get worse, the people who are in poverty now have a mentality that means they'll never break out of poverty, thanks to these people. Everything they touch, everything they touch is wrong. I don't have any superstitious or uh, reverence or any other kind of reverence toward these people, and nor should you. Th this is a bane. This is the bane of our existence. This is a scourge on society. And the idea that I would want to subsidize this or they need more funding, no. Nope. And now let's look at what is the legal regime she favors in its place. The new legal regime, she says, should impose a presumptive ban on homeschooling, allowing an exception for parents who can satisfy a burden of justification. And it should impose significant restrictions on any homeschooling allowed under this exception. She later elaborates on what she means here. She means cases like when you have a disabled child who may need specialized education that can't be provided in a local school, that could be an example. Or you have somebody who's a, a specially skilled artist who needs a, a curriculum that is 
that accommodates that particular skill and that allows it to flourish. So in other words, very, very, very rare kinds of exceptions. She says, surveying laws on homeschooling in other countries, on the restrictive end, some countries like Germany ban it altogether and enforce the ban strictly. And now this is chilling. She says, Germany's federal constitutional court upheld the ban based partly on, quote, the general interest of society in avoiding the emergence of parallel societies based on separate philosophical convictions. Wow. You are going to have the mainstream philosophical convictions, citizen. It's just amazing to me how much herd mentality and groupthink there is in Europe. I mean, in the United States, we're like a veritable hotbed of independent thought compared to what you will find in, in these countries. I mean, and a proxy for that is how the libertarian movement is doing in these countries, and it's much worse than in the U.S. Basically, everybody, yeah, I mean, most people do hold the, let's say, the prevailing philosophical convictions. You would think that a statement like that would at least make you curious. Jeez, that's creepy. Like, we, we have to, it has to be guaranteed that we all have the same philosophical convictions. What is it that they're so afraid of? Like, wouldn't you be curious about that? And yet, most people, Frankly, if we do opinion polls, it looks to me like most Western Europeans just say, okay, yeah, whatever philosophical convictions you want me to have, I'll just repeat back to you what you say to me. And listen, I'm not meaning to, I love Europe and I love my European friends and they're the ones who more than anyone will back up what I'm saying. So then uh, we get, this is also talking about Germany. The court noted that even if homeschooling could meet children's academic needs, the social integration required for a tolerant society could only be achieved through attendance at public or private schools. And then she goes into her theory as to why children have a positive right to the kind of education she thinks they should have. And now we get to her recommended restrictions. States should impose significant restrictions on homeschooling. Legislatures should do this on their own initiative. But courts must make clear that the current regime violates children's constitutional rights, which, by the way, she invented. There's nothing to any of that. And that restrictions along the lines described below are required, are required. So notice that. Here she is spending the article saying that children won't be educated to function in a democratic society unless we have them in our schools. If they're homeschooled, they're not going to get that important component. But notice what life in a democratic society means to her. It means rule by people like her. That, yeah, it'd be nice if the legislators would go ahead and do these things that I want. But if they don't, then people like me from law schools are going to sit in the courts and tell them that they're required to do these things. Because we decided that children have a constitutional right to be exposed to our point of view and our point of view only. And so it's required that you do these things. That is what democratic society means to her that people like Elizabeth Bartholin will tell us what to do. Then she says, laughingly, the goal is not to indoctrinate children in one majority culture perspective. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But to expose children to the wide range of views characteristic of our democracy and the wide range of abilities and learning needed to function in this democracy. Okay, well, we've already seen there's no wide range of views that anybody gets exposed to in school. Or, or otherwise, they wouldn't leave school believing in the same set of propositions about everything. I mean, I can predict everything that a recent high school graduate believes about everything. I don't have to stop and say, well, in school, I know they were exposed to a wide range of views because that's what Elizabeth Barthel had told me goes on. I know what they believe about everything. And I know they've never been exposed to competing arguments. I mean, I could, I could leave them bawling in the corner out of absolute confusion about the meaning of life after talking to them for two minutes, shredding things they've been taught are sacred and shredding what they've been taught to believe uh, and saying, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? They wouldn't know what to think because they haven't been exposed to a wide variety of views. A wide range of abilities. Are you kidding me? After 13 years in these institutions, so first grade through 12th grade plus kindergarten, they come out of school with nothing. What are the skills they come out with? How do they get employed? Well, they go to college for four more years, which, by the way, sometimes is the th right thing to do. But what are they supposed to do with just what they got in high school, for example? 
what skills do they have to cope in the 21st century? So I, of course, have to mention the Ron Paul curriculum because I created hundreds of videos for it. Yes, we teach the traditional subjects. And yes, you do get a variety of perspectives. In my stuff, I say, okay, here's the standard view and here's a different view. Okay, that's more than we can say for the so-called public schools. But we also teach them, yes, skills. We, t- we give them these abilities that they need to be successful. So we teach them, for example, how to run a home business. They're not being taught that in traditional school. How to write effective advertising copy, which is a skill that is very lucrative. If you have it, you, you will do very well. We teach them how to manage their money. Does that look like a skill most Americans have? Are they being taught that in school? We teach to them. And also how to express themselves, how to be effective public speakers, how to use the tools of the 21st century, like a YouTube channel or a blog, effectively to convey their ideas. We're giving them these abilities. We, the homeschoolers, are giving them these abilities. The the schools that Elizabeth Bartlett wants to imprison them in are not giving them this stuff. And then we read under specific requirements to ensure an adequate education, annual demonstration by parents of justification for an exception to the presumption against homeschooling, submission by parents of intended curriculum and education plan, including hours of instruction for approval in advance of each school year with approval conditioned on demonstration that parents will provide the essentials of public school education, submission by parents of education credentials and other evidence of ability to provide the essentials of education provided to public schoolers, for approval in advance of each school year. And we've already gone over that. They don't need to to have all this knowledge. They just use materials created by other people. And as I said, in in my school, we had a bunch of coaches who were just given a history textbook and told, just read them. (laughs) I mean, that was basically it. And then other things, um, uh, testing, uh, home visits by school authorities and stuff like that. So it is worth knowing, even though, this stuff is highly unlikely to be implemented on any level. What these people think about you, that's what they think about you. The hatred and loathing for you comes through throughout this entire thing. If the problem were that 90% of homeschoolers were secular left liberals and they weren't being exposed to alternative perspectives or they thought that alternative perspectives were all backwards hicks and idiots, it's not that Elizabeth Bartlett would be saying, well, they, they really need to read some Thomas Aquinas so they'll understand that that's a caricature, right? I mean, we have to expose them to that. That would not happen. She'd be perfectly happy with that situation. She would not be lecturing us. It is because specifically the people doing the homeschooling, a majority of them are people she loathes and she is gonna take those kids away from those parents and make sure that they are exposed to stuff their parents hate and then send them back to the parents. And then you're gonna be taxed to pay for that. And even though that violates your conscience, your conscience doesn't matter. Her conscience matters. She's not going to pay to support your church, and nor should she. But you're going to pay to support her church. And her church is an unforgiving church. Her church involves taking your kids, forcing them to go there, and making fun of them, and exposing them to bullies if they don't go along with the majority culture. And they come home shells of their former selves. That's a merciless church. And it's a church that makes all kinds of grandiose promises, doesn't it? About what they're going to learn and all the skills they'll have and the way they'll cope in society. And at the end, they have nothing to show for it except some propaganda, some practical knowledge, um, not a lot that they're actually going to use, and no way to cope in life except to send out some applications to spend six figures on four more years with the same people. Some church. All right, the article will be linked at tomwoods.com slash 1638 if you want to put yourself through the torture of reading it. And if you appreciate and enjoy what I'm doing, I hope you will consider joining me as a supporting listener because one of the benefits, not only do I have a nice group, the Tom Woods Show Elite, but that's a group where we can have differences of opinion. One of the things in this article says that that students need to be exposed to other people with different perspectives and learn how to engage with them in a civil way. That is absolutely not what you get taught in school, but that is what happens in the Tom Woods Show Elite because we have a variety of opinions on some things. And on this virus, not everybody agrees with me completely, but we're able to talk to each other without automatically assuming that people who disagree with us want their grandmothers to die. And if that's something that would be refreshing to you, 
then please join me over at supportinglisteners.com where you will see many, many benefits, not just the group, but the group is going to help keep you sane during these insane times. So warm my heart by going over to supportinglisteners.com and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.